Okay, good evening and welcome to our internet safety and cyber awareness uh, presentation tonight. Um, I was saying to folks up here earlier before we started that I'm here as much as a dad, as of a dad of a 10 year old and a seven year old and our 10 year old just decided to join Instagram and not tell us. So um, I'm here to, to learn just as much as everyone else is tonight. So welcome, thank you for coming out tonight. I'd like to turn over the program to Mr. Jeff Tomlinson. He's the director of safety and security for the school district and he's gonna walk you through the program tonight. Good evening. Uh, for those of you who don't know who I am, I, my name is Jeff Tomlinson. I came to the school district about two years ago uh, in the position of director of safety for the school district. Another thing you may or may not know, a lot of school districts don't have such a position. Um, but the school board superintendent, Dr. Griffin, felt that this was an important thing for the students, faculty, staff, and the community to have such a position. You'll start to see other school districts now are creating a similar position. And this is all about emergency management, response to crisis, and it's also being involved in educational programs like we're gonna talk about tonight. Uh, so you may um, see me at other events moving forward. But I wanted to share with you tonight as we talk about internet and cyber security. Uh, I spent about 30 years in law enforcement before I came to the school district. Spent 21 years with the Federal Bureau of Investigation, having worked in New York City, Philadelphia, and Washington, D.C. And more and more over the, over the years, technology, computer, cyber, intrusion, bigger and bigger issue. Uh, and it's also an issue for our young folks. So I wanted to share with you, 69% of teenagers own a computer. 63% of teens go online every single day. 93% of 12 to 17 year olds are on the internet at least once a week. An average teenager has 201 Facebook friends. One in three um, are, on, are online and in, in speaking to individuals that they don't know. 75% of the teens between 12 and 17 have cell phones. Anybody want to take a guess the average number of text messages a teenager receives and sends in a month? Anybody want to take a guess? Go ahead. 5,000. No, that, that's probably my daughter <laughs> based on her phone bill, but uh, about 1,500. Okay, so there's a lot of things that are going on in the way they're communicating. Girls are more likely than boys to be cyber bullied and we'll probably speak to that a little bit tonight with our guests. 97% uh, of the teens play online computer games. 27% of those play with individuals they don't know. Okay. 55% of the teens who have gone out on the internet have given complete strangers personal information to include photographs. 55%. So I wanted to share some statistics with you to kind of set the baseline um, of where we're, what's going on out there and, and the different things that we face here at school and the things that you face at home. And with that, I'd like to introduce Dave Bussinger from the Horsham Township Police to speak a little bit about what goes on locally. We, the school district has a very strong working relationship with both the Horsham Township Police Department and the Hapro Police Department on a variety of areas of concern to include um, this issue. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. <clears throat> Evening, everybody. Thanks for coming out. Uh, I know we all have to take time out of our busy lives, and this is an important program um, to, do, to do that, and it's worth, worth, well worthwhile. Um, my name is Dave Bussinger. I'm a detective with Horsham. I've been with Horsham Police for 29 years. 18 of those years, I have been a detective. Through my um, career, I have had the privilege of actually talking to probably thousands of our students within the Hapro Horsham School District. Uh, back in the 90s, I was the DARE instructor here for eight years at Keith Valley. Uh, I've had countless, um, probably countless classroom hours from teachers inviting me to come in and talk to their students, ranging from all sorts of uh, subjects such as cyberbullying, internet safety, crime scene investigation, uh, right down to law enforcement careers. 
So I've had a lot of extensive experience in the classroom. I'm really proud that about eight or nine years ago, myself and my partner Bob Waltz really were instrumental in bringing the Internet Safety Program to the Hapro Horsham School District. What Bob and I did for two years was we uh, had assemblies in every school in the district and we reached out and talked to every student for two years about Internet safety. We were the only police department and the only school district doing that at that time. So I think that's a real credit to the administration of the school district and the police department. And that's something that you know, I'm really proud of. So I've had a real good experience with the kids. Uh, one of the things I learned up front real quick was the teachers always gave the kids the speech. You know, Detective Bussinger's coming in in about 15 minutes and you better be good and you better not get him mad and you better not say anything really bad and you know. And how I would break that ice is when I would come in, I'd say, I know you got the speech. Throw the speech out the window. We're going to do two things today. We're going to respect each other, and we're going to discuss whatever we want to discuss. And you can ask me any question you want to ask. Two things. We respect each other, and if you ask me a question that you know I don't like, be prepared to hear an answer that you might not like. What that did was it would just open the ice, or oh, it would be an icebreaker for the kids. You could see the, the weight of the world was off. Hey, well, now we could talk to this guy. Now I'm like a spy among the ranks and they don't even know it. Because they would open up to me and they would tell me how they were you know, getting around the security systems in their parents' you know, computer, what they were doing with their friends, how they were texting, why they were texting. And I was <clears throat> learning all these trends. So basically when I got done a class, I really learned more from them, <clears throat> excuse me, than I think they learned from me. And that was invaluable to me in the investigations that I do because what you're going to hear about tonight is what's happening in Horsham, what's happening in Hapro, what's happening with us as adults and what's happening with our kids because I deal with it almost on a daily basis. Um, one of the trends that I'm seeing is that in the course of probably our investigations, 95% of the harassment and everything else is adult to adult. There's probably only 5% that we're seeing that's actually involving kids, which is a good thing. I mean, perfect would be zero, but it, we don't live in a perfect world. But the thing that I'm seeing is that very little of it anymore is through the computers, the laptops, things that you folks are probably monitoring at home. Where they're getting in trouble is with all the social media, with the cell phones, with the Twitter, with the Facebooks, that's where they're getting in trouble, that's where the cyberbullying is happening, that's where the internet safety problems are, are really occurring. So we as adults and we as parents, we have to be really vigilant on not only what are the kids doing on the computers, probably now they're doing their homework, but we really have to be vigilant on what they're texting, their phones, what's in there, who they're texting, again, how many times they're texting. Um, the, the amount of calls that we're receiving, it's very rare for the police department for us to have one day go by that we don't have somebody come in and say, I'm being harassed, uh, I've gotten harassing text messages, um, you know, things like that. So the manpower and the hours that are spent in investigating this are phenomenal. I mean, you just wouldn't believe it. I mean, it's, it really has taken a chunk out of all in law enforcement. Uh, and the problem is, we as law enforcement officers can't keep up with the technology. It's just impossible. Just like you folks probably can't keep up with a lot of stuff that your kids are doing. So it is important for us to talk about this. It's important for us to stay um, vigilant and you know, just do, do the best we can. Having said that, I'm going to turn it over to Dave. I will be around to answer any questions afterwards uh, about how I investigate or how the Horsham Police respond to a call uh, regarding this topic, so I'll be here. Thanks. Good evening. Thank you for being here. I guess one of the first things we could address is all the empty seats. That saddens me because I was really hopeful we'd have a full house. This is something that affects the entire community. Whether you have a, a student enrolled in the school or not, these type of things impact your community. As you heard from our, our local officials, our officers here in Horsham, and the people in charge of the security and the safety of our students, staff, and faculty, and guests at the school district. 
Attorney General Kathleen Kane takes a very serious role in protecting our students, our families, our seniors, the public at large. And part of that is why we're here this evening. We'd like to share with you some information that we have obtained through the Attorney General's office due to our investigations, our trainings, and other information that we've acquired regarding safety on the internet. What we're gonna do this evening, I'd like to give you a little bit of an overview of some of the things that our office does uh, in concert with this topic, as well as some good crime prevention tips, some information you can use yourselves as adults and share hopefully with everyone in your family and get your students and family and children all on the same playing field when it comes to internet safety. You know, it takes everyone to be involved to make your safety system work. You could put an alarm in your house and if you fail to alarm the windows, but all the doors are heavily guarded, somebody could get in. That weak link. Well, that happens with everything, including cyber safety. So a lot of the information we're gonna have today works together. You have to apply all the aspects of it to make it successful. So again, I'm sorry that we have a lot of empty seats because these folks aren't getting the information that they could use to protect their families. So we ask you to share what you learned today with others. At the end of the program, I've brought a lot of brochures and some booklets. There's some handouts up on the front table in the lobby. Please be sure you pick those items up on your way through. Uh, when we talk about internet safety and security, you know, the hardware is one aspect in that chain that we talked about. The hardware is the actual computer itself. How many people have a home computer? Either it's a desktop or a laptop that you utilize in the home. A lot of folks that are here, right? You're in control of that hardware, aren't you? Right? As the adult in the house, you should be in control of the hardware. But the hardware is not the only link. The software that's running on the hardware needs to be secured as well. And a lot of times, as you heard earlier from Dave, the kids know more than we do and more than the parents do. And that leaves another link that could be loosened up in that chain of security. So we have to be careful about it. When we go out and we purchase things to protect our online computer, we look at things like firewalls and security software. But if you're buying it from a pop-up that arrives online when you're out there shopping for the holidays, that may be a trick. You know, the scammers and the fraudsters and the hackers, they love to send you free security software because you're gonna be fooled into that false sense of security. You're gonna click on the pop-up and you're gonna download it and say, boy, am I good to go. The bad guys are good to go. Good to go to access your computer without your knowledge, to extract your family's information, your personal identifiers, your name, address, date of birth, social security number, account numbers, passwords, PIN numbers. All that access can be breached because you thought you were loading a security product when in fact it was a scam. It was a spoofed pop-up. It looks like the real deal. Even has logos and trademarks, all the information that would make it look valid, but it's not. When you purchase your software security for your hardware, I want you to go to legitimate vendors, a retailer, yeah, okay, you're gonna pay out of pocket. It's not cheap, and I understand that. But can you put a price on your family's protection? No. Make sure it's valid from a retailer that you know and you trust. The packaging is sealed. It has a certificate of authenticity, and that it's properly installed and functioning, and you continue the updates only through the legitimate source from which you originally purchased the product. Nothing from a flea market, discount store, nothing online. This is where you can run into trouble. If you're not really a savvy consumer and very high tech, you can really run into some problems that way. So we really encourage everybody to think security of the hardware and the software together. Now there's another link as we move down the chain, and that's parenting. Devices that are in your home, you should have a little bit more control over by having them in an open space. The computer should be maybe at the kitchen table or in the living room where the family interacts. It shouldn't be in the student's bedroom where they can show, close the door and you don't have a clue what's going on online. So that you can try to manipulate by location. But as you heard earlier, the family computer is not the only resource. When the kids walk out the door, they got their smartphones, iPhones, Androids, iPads, iTablets, you name it, they got it. 
I run out of eyes sometimes, right? But the problem is, how do you control that device when it leaves the house? Well, it's more difficult, but it's not impossible. A lot of apps have downloads that are parental controls. You need to be in control. It's not a matter of I don't trust my child, because that's what they're going to throw up at you right away. You don't trust me, Mom. But Dad, you know I'm good. I'm not going to do anything wrong. Why are you treating me like this? Because you love them and you care about them. You know, it's all about really being a parent. And the kids might not get it right away, but I think if you explain it and, and sit down with them and show them that it's not about I don't trust you, I don't trust the other people that are lurking in the shadows in the internet. And they do. And it's bad news. And I, I brought some numbers too, and you know, as you heard in the beginning of the program, you know, a lot of these numbers are staggering. You know, three-year-olds are online. Can you imagine that? Right? My nephew is seven, and at his school, he has internet computer class. <laughs> I thought he was kidding. I'm like, you, you what? He's seven. But you know what? The internet's a great tool. It's a resource. It's information. You know, back in my day, when I was a kid way back in the old times, we had a thing called, are you ready for this? Encyclopedias. <laughs> That's pre-Google. You had to use an encyclopedia. You had to go get a book, and you had to book, pull something out and, and actually physically work to get the information. It didn't drop into your phone. Boop, hey, 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 there you go, right there. But today it's different, and we know that. We're all adapting to it, and we all learn as we go. The problem is our kids are learning at a much faster rate than we are when it comes to technology. So how do we keep up? Parental controls is one of those tools. You can kind of slow them down a little bit, kind of hopefully move your, your gap a little bit in that educational gap of technology. You know, make sure you are in control of the passwords and the access to certain applications and certain sites. And there's tools out there you can use to do this. And we'll go over some of them as we move through the program. You know, another thing that we have to be careful of is the GPS setting on these portable devices. When someone takes a photo, if they're going to be on Instagram or, or Snapchat or one of these new apps, when they take a photo, if the GPS is enabled and turned on in that device, the person looking and viewing that photo can actually find the location the photo was taken. You right click on it, you pull up the GPS location, and you have the actual coordinates of the photo. What if the photo was in your daughter's bedroom? She took a picture of her and her teddy bears. A child predator or someone it means harm could now access the location of that bedroom. That's scary. From a photo, a harmless, simple photo. So it's important that we understand how these devices work and that we can turn off the GPS feature and block that feature. Now there's good reason to have GPS on too. There's family tracking plans that you can track all the phones in your network. So if you purchase a family plan on one of the service providers and your phones are all linked, you might be able to bring up exactly where your son or daughter might be at that time with their phone. So we have to weigh this. What are the benefits? What are the chances? What's worth what? And if we can train each other and our families to share information with each other face to face before we go online, that would be a lot easier. If you can sit down and explain to your children how important it is not to have an active GPS advance on when you're taking a digital photo and then sharing it online. You heard the numbers about how the percentage of people that share information. You know, the teens are, are the biggest ones. 73% of teens that are surveyed admit that they're not careful about what they put out there. They don't think first, they just post. They have to get that text back before the other friend does. It's a challenge, it's a race. I see kids with the thumbs and I'm going, how many thumbs does that kid have? I could, I, you know, I'm like one finger trying to get around on the phone to do a text, right? But we see the kids and they're, they're bam, messages are flying back and forth. Is there any time, did they pause at all and say, well, wait, am I sharing too much? Where's, where's that going? I'm sending it to Susan but do I know if Susan's sharing it with two people or 200 or 2 million? She doesn't know. And the problem is she's not thinking about that. She doesn't care because they live in the moment. 
You know, they live in the moment. They want to act and interact as quickly as they can with their friends and get that information shared. And that leads to a lot of problems. You know, identity theft is a huge, huge issue. And identity theft often is through technology. Technology can be used to steal people's personal information and identities. You know, when we go online and use devices, we need to think about identity protection. Don't use your actual name in your email or logons for any of these online services or applications. You know, come up with, with another name, a username that you create. And again, let's be careful about what type of information we're sharing in our made up username. You know, you're going to see a video as we move through the program I brought with us this evening, and you're going to see that a username actually drew negative attention to a 13-year-old girl that caused a big problem. So we even have to be careful about what names that we use online. We have to remember when we're online sharing information that everything that we put out like on Facebook or social networking, Twitter, these different devices and, and services, I always try to tell people, think of it as a history lesson. All right, we're in school today, so we're gonna use history class as our example. You don't wanna go online and post what you're gonna do next week. Hey, we're going down the shore for a week. We can't wait to get there. The countdown is on, seven more days, and we're headed for the beach. That opens you up to a lot of problems. Home burglaries. Everyone knows you're not home. Other aspects of people sharing information, posing as your, your daughter or your son or someone else in the family. Someone hacking your contact list and sending a scam email out advising that on your trip, you ran into a problem and you've lost your wallet, your money, your car keys and cell phone. Please send $5,000 to help me out. I'll pay you back when I get home. The problem is you didn't send that message. You didn't have a problem. A hacker has used your address list and your email account to send this out to everyone in your contacts. So people start sending a couple thousand dollars and this guy's making money and everyone thinks they're helping you. You come home to everyone going, oh, wow, well, you heard about your emergency. What emergency? I sent you the 5000 You can pay me back, can't you? Whoa, wait a minute. I, I, I didn't get any money from you. What, what are you talking about? This is the type of things that happen online when we post information into the future. But what would happen if you came back from vacation and then posted, last week we had a great time at the shore? That's a lot safer. It's already happened, it's in the past, very difficult to manipulate that information and use it against you. It's already gone. Speaking of information that's online and how it moves, how long does something stay online once you post it? Anybody have an idea? Anybody? Forever, right? But wait, what if you delete it? Is it gone? No, no. Delete means it's taking it out of the view on that particular site or screen. It doesn't mean it's gone, doesn't mean it's erased. It can be pulled back up and resent and shared and reused on and on and on. You know the TV commercial, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas? What happens online stays online. Even if it's happened in Vegas, it's gonna be every place. Okay, you can't trust it. You can't think, oh, I've deleted that. No, that's not a sure answer to getting rid of information that you thought was online. You know, a lot of things that we have uh, with, with digital footprints, you know, people can kind of track your history too. People can start to monitor and see what sites you visit and how often and what frequency and start to build a pattern of your behavior which would entice them to develop questions to encounter you online and start extracting information slowly from you to steal your identities. How many people have a password used that's their mother's maiden name? Anyone ever been asked for that as a password? Anybody? A couple of people? That's it, just a few? All right, it's pretty common. A lot of different credit card services, banking institutions, they'll ask you, mother's maiden name? Ever hear of a thing called Ancestry.com? How easy do you think it is to find someone's mother's maiden name going online? It's not a great security question now, is it? 
when you think about it, kind of loses its teeth. That's a poor question. Yeah, you know, I, I said to my father, he was redoing his, he's kind of not cool with the online banking thing yet. But I said to him, he's like, well, I gotta, they're asking me my mother's maiden name for my password. I said, no, 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 we're not gonna do that. I said, you're gonna pick a different question. So uh, I picked for him your pet's name. He goes, but I don't have a pet. I said, exactly. No one's gonna be able to figure that out because there's no posting on Facebook of the dog. There's no cat. There's nothing. So he just created a false name for a false pet, and that became the security question. Much tougher for someone to hack and figure out because there's no reality to match it to. There's nothing there that exists. I stopped at a fast food restaurant one night after a presentation uh, to get a cup of coffee, and uh, I'm standing there, and the young girl was probably around 9 o'clock at night. They were getting ready to close around 10, I guess. And the young girl at the register had to be about 16 years old at the most. And she serves me my, uh, my drink and I get the receipt. And I don't know why I even looked at the receipt for a cup of coffee, but I did. And it had the young cashier's full name printed on the receipt. Kathy Watkins, your server was Kathy Watkins. And I said to her, I said, are you really Kathy Watkins? She goes, yeah, how'd you know that? I said, you just handed me the receipt. It has your full first and last name on it. Oh, I guess I never saw that. So I sat down and I'm thinking about this and I'm thinking like, that's, that's not good. This, this is really bad. So I pulled out my smartphone and I decided to Google search the town that I was in, her name, and I punched in the local high school and middle school. And I put all these things in the search window and guess what came up? her photo on the field hockey team. Her father's business two blocks away, he's a home improvement contractor, works out of his home, so I also have their home address and phone number now on my phone. And I went up and I got the manager. I said, can I talk to you privately for a minute? He says, well, what's going on? Is there a problem with your meal? I said, no, the problem came after the meal when I got the receipt. Oh, we overcharged you. I said, no, you're putting that young lady at risk. What? So, of course, I had explained who I was, so he didn't call the cops, thinking I'm like some crazy guy. And I said, look, this is, you know, this is what our office does. We try to protect people, and your company is putting her at risk. I said, here's her address. Here's what her father's business is. Here's her picture on the hockey team, and the guy could have fell over. Oh, my. Oh, I, I got to call corporate first thing in the morning. We're going to change this. I'm like, please do. But who would have thought something as simple as the receipt for a cup of coffee could lead someone to that young lady's front door? Would you have thought of that? The bad guys are always looking for any angle they can play. We have to be a step ahead of them, but it's, it's tough. We're outnumbered. You can ask the officers, they'll tell you. You know, law enforcement's outnumbered. Pennsylvania among the states ranks 19th for the cases reported of identity theft. 19th. That's too high. One out of five people will become a victim of identity theft annually. The United States has 10 million reported cases of identity theft annually. 10 million cases. At a cost of $58 billion. That's a lot of money. We know what the economy looks like. Do you think $58 billion being stolen helps? No. Makes things worse. Just piles it on, piles it on. So we talked about some of these things, and we also want to share the idea that you have to share with your families, your children, about their online presence. What are they engaged in online? What types of activities are they involved in? We heard about video games. My son loved video games. He was into it. Oh, boy. Well, what we did was we had all the kids come to our house. In the family room, we had a large screen TV. We had these big like beanbag sofa backs that went onto the floor. All the kids could play all day because I sat in the chair in the corner reading a book, watching what was going on. They weren't going down the basement in a private room. They weren't going up into a bedroom. And my son wasn't going someplace where I had no control over what was happening. Everyone came to our house. Parental control. Just me being in the room, I think, was a good parental control. But these are the things we have to look at. How are they going to be viewed online in the future? Because we said everything that goes online stays online, right? 
So if your high school student goes out with his buddies and decides he's going to try out having a, maybe a beer for the first time, and his friend thinks it's pretty funny and takes his photo, that gets posted online. Then he applies for college at a university he's really hopeful into and they start checking Facebook and social networking sites to see what kind of character that young man has. That could be a problem. Or he goes for his first job interview and that potential employer uses online searches as part of their background checks prior to interviewing the subjects. That could be a problem. How are you going to be looked at and perceived by others when you have online activity that you shouldn't be proud of. And for some reason, our young people today don't think first, they act first. And that's a big problem. So we need to keep all these things in mind. And with that, I'd like to go move into another aspect of this and talk a little bit uh, about some of the different websites and, and uh, applications that are out there. And then we're gonna show you two short videos that are very, very important. So with that, I just want to jump into the fact that online, American teens, these are the most popular sites and applications that parents need to become aware of. Obviously, we've all heard of Facebook, right? That's the big one. Number one, are the security settings really secure? Not really. You need to maintain them. They don't automatically stay in the secure setting that you may have posted. You need to be on top of that and protect it and be watchful of it. Instagram, let's send a photo to one another instantly, quickly. The problem is when those photos become something that you should not be sending to another person. Again, we have to monitor it. Twitter, quick, short communications back and forth. And again, these devices and these applications can be used for a lot of entertainment, a lot of information, and it can also be used for cyberbullying, sexting, and other concerns that might be inappropriate. Snapchat, same type of thing, instant messages and videos and photos. But the Snapchat tells you that after a short amount of time, those postings will disappear and automatically be deleted. I think I told you that deletion doesn't mean gone, right? So that's gonna give you that false illusion that you're protected, that what you put out there, will, it'll go away in just you know, a couple hours. Who's gonna see it? Everyone, everyone. Pinterest is like a bulletin board. People post things up and it stays up. And then there's focal groups that can discuss different things that are posted there on that bulletin board. Vine is also a short six second video clips that are posted quickly, but it also has a 17 plus rating in the iTunes store when you log in for that. So it's like an R rated movie rating, 17 and older. So let's think about who should be using that. Not your middle school students, not your elementary school students. And of course, there's a lot of these, and I'm not gonna bore you by just reading down the list. What I would like to do is give you a couple of sites that you can go that are parental controls that might be a lot of help as well. Two of these are Mobile Spy. Mobile Spy is something to look into, understand its application and how it works, as well as Phone Sheriff. For the smartphones, the iPhones, and cellular telephones, Phone Sheriff is another great device. With that, I'd like to uh, open up the video portion. These are true stories of two young ladies that were abducted by online predators. I want to warn you now, what you're going to hear could be very disturbing. So again, I encourage you to have talks with your children, discuss, there's a lot of resources online. Uh, our website, www.attorneygeneral.gov, we have a child predator unit. Um, our child predator unit engages undercover agents who go online posing as other individuals, other age brackets, trying to track and detect child predators and stop them before we have tragedies like we just saw on the videos. Uh, we actually just made a recent arrest, two recent arrests. Uh, press release from our office September 24th indicates uh, Attorney General Kathleen Kane announced the arrest of two Pennsylvania men as part of an ongoing effort in the target of online sharing, downloading, and distribution of child pornography. 
A Bucks County gentleman out of Yardley, Pennsylvania has been arrested and a South Williamsport Lycoming County resident was also arrested, two separate cases. We're talking over 100 images of child pornography in the one case and multiple counts, 16 counts of child pornography in the Lycoming County case. So we have over 300 arrests from our child predator unit. It's sad that we have to even engage in that kind of law enforcement today, but it's necessary. As you learn today some of the information, uh, we encourage you again to just continue to be part of your child's life, be part of their network, engage them in a positive manner with the information about online safety. The National Center for uh, Missing and Exploited Children has a lot of resources as well as of course I'm sure your school and your local police as well as the Attorney General's office we're always available to try and assist you with more prevention tips and information and how to report these type of crimes. Uh, with that I think we're at the point where we'll, we'll all be available to take questions from, from the audience. I just had a couple of comments before if that's okay. I know we're running on time. So when we step back and we look at what goes on in our school district and in Hapro and Horsham, this um, the Snapchat is concerning to me. If you hear about it, I'd like you to let us know, whether it's through a teacher that gets to us, the principal that gets to us. I don't know if Mr. Kircher is still here. I'm sorry, what's that? Oh, he just turned on. You know, that it, the, the, the kids and feeling invincible, you know, with the idea of taking a picture and it's going to go away, they may do things that they feel that that's a safe way to do it. Um, the way we operate with Horsham Police and Hapro Police, we don't re advertise a lot of what we're doing behind the scenes, okay? We've had situations in, over the last year or two where people have posted things, and it looks like this young lady posted it when it was friends that posted it uh, to get this uh, individual in trouble or looked upon by others in the district in a poor light. Okay, so we work on these aggressively with both police departments, and we do work with Montgomery County um, Violent Sex Offender Unit as need be as well. So there's a lot of things that go on behind the scenes. What we would ask from you is to sh let us know what you hear. If it doesn't feel right, go with your gut. It probably isn't, but I'd rather know about it and find it be nothing than you think I have nowhere to go. If you don't know where to go, police departments are there. We're here. We talk. Um, frequently uh, because I, I am concerned about that piece moving forward and we need to stay educated on what's out there. I like to call it being predictive and laying down tripwires or things that indicate us. We may not know which particular student in the population or students may be involved either as the aggressor or the victim, but we can start to look at what they might look like and, and then see if we can find them, but it's got to be a relationship with you as well as we share what our kids are concerned about and what they're doing. That makes sense? Seem fair? Okay, I don't know, Detective Bussner, Mr. Kircher, anything that you wanna to add to that? Just any questions, uh, I'd be more than happy to field for the local, what, uh, if you folks have any questions of what actually I've been involved with or, or um, with how we respond or how I respond to an investigation, I'd be more than happy to, to answer those questions. Um, I, I think what Dave said was, was really important, and that's what we see, is that the, um, the people that are out there that are grooming the kids, they do look for the, the kid that might be a little socially inept, uh, may have the problems at home, maybe, you know, um, have parents that are, are, are working two jobs or whatever, um, and they are very good at what they do. Um, we have had and I've been directly involved with arrests where guys have met uh, or thought they were meeting um, a 13-year-old or a 12-year-old girl. Uh, one case in particular, um, we were actually doing the online um, surfing, so to speak, and we came up with a guy and he wanted to meet, thought we were, thought we were 12 years old, he thought I was 12 years old. Um, we decided to meet at the, one of the local March, I'm not going to say where, but um, he didn't meet a 12-year-old girl. He met a 45-year-old cop. Um, one of the disturbing things about that whole case was when we 
um, got a search warrant for his car. One of the things that we had discussed online was the movies that the girl liked and what candy she liked and what other little games she liked. <clears throat> he had a duffel bag in the back of his car with the games that she liked, with the movies she liked, a roll of duct tape, masks, everything that would go with what we just saw up here. And thankfully, we got him before he got somebody's child. Um, so it does happen in Horsham. It happens in Hapro. There isn't a community safe. Um, you know, and, and I hope you walk out of here scared a little bit, um, but that maybe will make you be more vigilant, like I said earlier, you know, that, that we need to really be online um, with what our kids are doing. Because most of the cases that I have where there's a child involved, or especially with the bullying or whatever, the parents really are not involved in, in that child's life as far as the cell phone and what Dave said, as soon as it walks out the door. It's almost like they don't really care. And that's where they're getting in trouble. And what the, the especially the girls that I've interviewed, the, the young girls that I've interviewed, what happens with their mentality is they may take a, a risque photograph of themselves and the first time it's kind of, it's scary to them. Their heart's beating, what's gonna happen, you know, this and that and this and that. And then they take another one or whatever. And then it becomes a very comfortable feeling to them where they're not thinking that they're doing anything wrong. And it's just now a matter of, ah, I just took another picture of myself and I'm sending it to my boyfriend and it's not gonna go anywhere. And then he sends it to his friends and so on and so on and so on. We've heard that story. You know, but I think they get in such a comfort zone that they don't realize that what they're doing is, is dangerous. You know, not only is it wrong and not only are they breaking the law, that's the last thing that they're wearing. It's just dangerous, you know. So again, um, we try to stay on top of it, but the technology, um, you know, I am certainly not a computer guy. I am, to be quite honest with you, I am probably your worst nightmare as far as a hacker because I learn all the tricks that the hackers learn. And when I'm doing an investigation, guess how I find you? Just what Dave said. That's how I find the bad guys. I mean, you know, most of the time now, I can do, I can do in an hour's work finding a bad guy that would take me eight hours, two weeks of pounding the street because of the internet. So, um, you know, unfortunately, the nature of the beast is when you become a cop, you also become very fine line there of, of you know, you learn how to, you learn almost how to be the bad guy too, you know? Um, granted, I'm on the good side, but we, we use the internet an awful lot too to, to track. Uh, one of the disturbing things that I saw in the video that really irritates law enforcement, did you hear when the, when the um, aunt, called the police and the detective contacted AOL at about, what, 11 o'clock at night? And he did not get the, uh, the name from AOL until six in the morning. That is very frustrating to us, especially when there, it could be a life or death situation. Um, because of privacy laws and they hide behind lawyers and they hide behind this and they hide behind that, we have to jump through hoops. To, to get a search warrant, to get a subpoena, to get something out to them immediately. We have to prove to them that this is a life or death situation. And sometimes that two, three, four hours um, it is, it is the, the difference between life and death. And it's very frustrating for, for law enforcement because we shouldn't have to, you know, they should be able to maybe go on our word and then we can always get the subpoenas or whatever they need out, you know, within a 24 hour period. Uh, that's something that we've been trying to push for.